intention to spend uh, this amount of time simply not true that's ridiculous uh, so when you come across it you go well that's that's ridiculous you don't pay any attention um, but I've learned how to keep a teachable spirit and I've also found uh, through my own study that even when somebody is on large scale wrong I can usually find something right in what they're saying amen uh, and so I have picked through mountains of bones to get small scraps of meat Amen. And sometimes when you do that, you go somewhere and you say, well, I know this isn't right. But then you sit down, you start listening to it, and you start finding out uh, scripture for scripture, verse for verse, word for word, it actually turned out to be right. Amen. And so that forced me to come back and say, okay, we're going to teach this again um, because what I had seemed right, but we were in the wrong context. Amen. So now that we got the right context, now we're going to be able uh, to put everything where it rightly belongs. Amen, somebody? All right. And so we are in Revelation chapter 19. And we made it to slide number four last week. Amen. And so this is our quick review to get back to slide number four. Amen. Revelation chapter 19. Uh, starting at verse number one says, after these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord, our God. Amen. And uh, the choir sang that quite beautifully on Sunday. I said, look at that. Amen. I don't, I don't think they chose that because we had looked at that verse in Bible study, but the Lord tends to make things match up like that. Amen. Somebody. Hallelujah, once again, is the Greek rendering of the Hebrew word hallelujah, meaning praise Yah. And Yah is, of course, the contraction or the shortened version of the name Yehovah. Amen. We talked a little bit about that last week. If it's contracted, which uh, in which case it would be written with just two letters, Y-H. Y'all know how we do nicknames. Amen. If it's contracted with just the two letters, uh, Y-H or Yod Hey in Hebrew, then it will be pronounced Yah. Amen. If it's at the end of a multisyllabic word, amen, then it becomes pronounced Yahu. Well, I, the example I gave was Elijah is actually Eliyahu. Uh, if Yod Hey is at the beginning of a multisyllabic word, it becomes Yeho. Uh, and so we have uh, Yehoshaphat, Yehoram, uh, Yehoniah, Jeconiah. Amen. And most famously, Yehoshua, uh, which we would say Jesus, uh, but also is the exact same name as Joshua. Joshua is the same name as Jesus, Yehoshua in Hebrew. All right. So Hallel means praise. It means to shine. It means to be bright. It means to be loud. It means to be clamorously foolish. Amen. And so hallelujah means get loud for Yah. It means to shine bright for Yehovah. It means to even become clamorously foolish in lifting up his name. All right? Deliverance. The evidence of superiority, esteem, and explosive ability belong to our God. And that is the meaning of salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. Amen. Once again, I think it's important to note that. The word salvation and the word deliverance is the same word. 
I think it's important to understand that because a lot of people think, well, now that I've gotten saved, now I have to get delivered. False. Wrong way of thinking. If you have gotten saved, according to the scripture, you have gotten delivered. What the saved and delivered person has to do then is learn how to walk in the deliverance that we have already received. Amen, somebody. See, delivered doesn't mean you no longer crave sin or sinful things. It means you are no longer trapped by it. You don't have to do it. Amen, somebody. All right. Moving right along. Uh, verse 2 said, for true and righteous are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication and he has avenged her blood on his, uh, the, avenged on her, rather, the blood of his servants shed by her. She shed the blood of the servants. He has avenged the blood of the servants on her. Verse 3, again, they said, hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne saying, amen, hallelujah. Then a voice came from the throne saying, praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. Amen. So all who are in heaven rejoice at the destruction of the harlot. Once again, that's reprobate Jerusalem, unbelieving Jerusalem, antichrist Jerusalem, because she corrupted the whole land. The whole land is Judea or Israel. And God has avenged on her the blood of his prophets and martyrs whom she, Jerusalem, has shed. And even Jesus said, a prophet cannot die except it be in Jerusalem. Amen. Uh, the Jews, the unbelieving Jews, have killed more of God's prophets than any other people group. The blood is on her from the blood of Abel to that of righteous Zechariah. Mm. Verse number six said, and I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thundering saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And this note is where we left off last week. The white wedding dress represents righteous acts, righteous deeds, righteous lifestyle. Lifestyle meaning how do you live? which is to say the saints are intended to live right. We are intended to live holy. We are intended to live pure. Amen? And every day we work on cooperating with the Holy Spirit so that the spirit of holiness will be seen in our lives. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of holiness. And when I interact with you, I want you to see the spirit of holiness in me and on me. But you know what gets in the way of you seeing that? Me. Because I want to tell you what I think. I want to show you how I feel. I want to do what's, what feels good to me or what seems right to me. And I have to learn how to listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And when I learn how to listen and to wait on him, when I learn how to speak when he says speak and how to shut up when he says shut up. Every situation is not the situation to speak. And every situation is not the situation to be silent. Every situation is not the situation for action. And every situation is not the situation to be still. Amen. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. Amen, somebody. And so the more we learn how to flow with the Spirit of God, the more the Spirit of God will be made manifest in the world through our lives. And that's what he wants. That is how we manifest the kingdom of God. If you really understand to reveal the kingdom of God, 
you have to reveal the kingship of God. The kingship of God is his rulership over us. So if we want people to see, experience, and enter into the kingdom, we have to allow them to see his kingship. And I can't show other people his kingship by doing what I want to do, by saying what I want to say, because that's showing my own rulership over me instead of allowing him to rule over what I say, what I do, where I go, and how I do it. Amen? Kingdom means king's domain. The domain is the place. So the kingdom is the place that is ruled by the king. My goal is for the king's domain to be me. I need to be the place where he rules, which requires me to humble myself and submit to him to speak when he says speak and to be silent when he says be silent. And it won't always match up. Matter of fact, it often won't match up with what you want to do. Because this old rusty rascal then says something crazy to me and I want to tell him something. And I'm sure enough an expert at telling it. I want to tell him. And the Holy Spirit said, no, nah, hold your peace. Let the Lord fight your battle. But they, but they was being disrespectful to me in front of everybody, Jesus. And Jesus said, yeah, but most importantly, they were being disrespectful to you in front of me. So if you just be quiet and let me handle it, it's going to be all right. You just be boiling over. <laughs> and then the Lord say, fix your face. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, now you got to go away somewhere and pray. <laughs> Even this has helped you. You know why? Because it, it has increased your prayer life. I got a message I preached some years ago. I might bring it back around sometime. So y'all got pre-warning, if you ever hear it, it, it it's, it's not a new message, amen, uh, but I, I only preached it once, so I, it's probably about due, it might have been 10, 15 years ago, I preached a message that was entitled, Thank You, Judas. Judas had a purpose. Do you understand that Judas is the reason that Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying? He knew what Judas was doing. And Judas drove him to go to the Lord to get himself ready. If Judas wasn't Judasing, if I can just make a new verb, <laughs> if Judas wasn't doing what Judas does, then how is Jesus going to do what Jesus does? Judas is necessary in your life. Judas drives you into the garden of prayer. Adversity drives you closer to the Lord. And sometimes adversity shows up as an individual. So instead of fuming and talking under your breath how much you can't stand this person, how about you say, thank you, Judas. You're causing me to grow. You're causing me to exercise patience. I am growing in the fruit of the spirit. Long suffering. If we're going to be like Jesus, we got to learn how to suffer long. They talked about him his whole life. This man is giving them the air to breathe so that they can talk about him. This, this man is giving them the air to breathe so they can smack him in the face and pluck hair out of his scalp and talk about his mama and mock him to his face. And he just stood there and let it go on because this is what was necessary to achieve God's goal. I hope y'all don't think he wanted to go to the cross. What do you think that prayer was about? If there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. He didn't look forward to nails in his hands. Nobody likes having the flesh beat off their body. He went in and said, I don't like this plan. Is there a plan B? Can't we just snap our finger and take everybody? No. All right, well, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. You're not going to always like the path, but he has selected the perfect path. The perfect path for us sometimes is painful, 
but perfect pain produces perfect power. So we've got to learn how to stay consistent and stay faithful in the midst of whatever path the Lord lays before us. What we cannot afford to do is let the path change our behavior. See, every day is warfare. People think spiritual warfare is just when you go to somebody's house and you, you know, speaking in tongues and, and casting out devils and slinging oil everywhere. You are in spiritual warfare every day. The greatest warfare you face is just keeping the flesh under control, subjecting it to the will of the Holy Spirit so that you will conduct yourself in righteousness. That's enough of a fight for each of us every day. And it is the necessary fight. Because to operate in certain levels of the anointing, you have to have mastered the low-level fight. Some folk trying to fight up in the heavenlies and they getting whooped on the earth. What you think going to happen when you go up a level? Out here trying to cast out demons and they smoking cigarettes. It ain't going to work. <laughs> out here trying to uh, pull down principalities and powers and you fornicating. It's not going to work. You got to get the fundamental things down first before you can go up and try to operate in things unseen. All right, let me move on. The white wedding dress represents righteous acts, righteous deeds. If you want to get married, you need the white dress. You need the clean linen. Amen. You need the righteous deeds. This is what he has called us to. Amen. The bridegroom has purchased the white dress for us. Don't you think it's maybe a little insult if he come to pick you up and you refuse to put the dress on? He paid for it with his own blood. Literally blood, sweat, and tears. As a man, I cannot imagine. If I pay $8,000 for your wedding dress you had shipped in from New York City, and on the wedding day you want to wear a little black cocktail dress. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> excuse me. You must be marrying somebody else. <laughs> All right. I better move on because we won't make it off the slide four if I stay there. Verse number nine. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Aha. Uh -huh. The messenger in heaven who speaks with the voice of many waters, whose voice is like thunder, is a redeemed human being who was saved by Jesus Christ. See, every time you see an angel, that doesn't mean a heavenly being. The word angel just means messenger. I've told you all this before. God has heavenly angels and God has earth angels an earth angel is just a messenger on earth when the book of revelation uh, says it's being written to the angel of the church at Ephesus the angel of the church at Sardis the angel of the church at Laodicea that's the chief messenger of the house that's the pastor praise the lord I am your earth angel but guess what? You are the earth angel to everyone who doesn't go to church. You are God's messenger to the unsaved. You are the pastor to your neighborhood. See, God has called me to be as an example to you so that you can be an example to those who don't have an example. They don't have a pastor, so you're their pastor. 
So when you say, well, I wouldn't expect the pastor to do that. Well, that means you shouldn't do that because you are their pastor. Anyone who don't know the Lord, you are the example of the Lord to them. Amen, somebody? Everybody filled with the Holy Ghost is an earth angel to somebody. Show sure enough if you got kids. Who is more of an example to the children than their own parents? Matter of fact, the old saying goes, children don't do what you say. They do what they see you do. Now, if what you say and what you do matches up, it becomes a mighty strong example. But if what you say and what you do don't match up together, they're going to do what they saw you do. Amen, somebody. If it's good enough for mama, it's good enough for me. Okay, but mama went to hell. Do you not understand? <laughs> Just because the reverend stood up there and said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But mama was sleeping with everybody's husband and uh, cheating on her taxes and uh, stealing from the job. Um, and she didn't change before she died. Don't nobody want to consider the fact that their mama, their grandmama might not have made it. But follow somebody who you can see is making it. Don't, don't follow what uh, older folks said just because they're older and they're in your family. Follow us right according to the word. Who do you see living the word? By their fruit, not by your bloodline, by your fruit, we will know. Amen? The messenger in heaven. Let me, before I go on, I, I, I didn't say the thing that was in the back of my mind, and I'm going to say it. Y'all know I'm an equal opportunity offender, all right? Because I've heard folks say, uh, how, no, how does that go? Uh, Baptist born, Baptist bred, and when I die, I'll be Baptist dead. Well, I've not heard that particular saying apply to apostolic, but we more or less had a man, same mindset. And what that is, is whatever mama thought must be right. That don't make it right just because your mama thought that. Just because your granddaddy was a pastor, that don't make what he said right. What's right is what's in the book. Catholics are born Catholic. They grow up Catholic and they die Catholic. But but doesn't match what's in the book. I'm apostolic, but I'm not hung up on being called apostolic. I'm hung up on what's in the book. Some of the things I teach, they don't match up with what my apostolic brethren are teaching. I don't care. I'm going with what's in the book. Amen? All right. The messenger in heaven who speaks with the voice of many waters, whose voice is like thunder, is a redeemed human being who was saved by Jesus Christ. He said, I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. That's how we know this was not a heavenly angel because heavenly angels don't have the testimony of Jesus. Heavenly angels haven't been saved. Heavenly angels were never lost, so they can't get saved. Amen, somebody. The Bible refers to the dragon also having angels. We don't call those heavenly angels. We call those fallen angels. Guess what? They also can't be saved. One of the reasons they hate you so much is because you can be saved. There's no salvation for them. Amen. God became a human being and died for us. The wages for sin is death. He didn't become an angel and die for angels. How would he do it? Angels don't have bodies. Amen? So he couldn't become an angel and then separate himself from his angel body. That's what death is, separation. Amen? All right. But he became a human because humans can die and saved us. So the heavenly angels are the ones that never rebelled, and the ones that rebelled can never be heavenly angels again. Though they are still angels, they're not heavenly angels, and they never will be again. You are their replacement. Nobody likes their replacement. Why so many folk uh, hate their sweetheart's ex? <laughs> well, or or, or the, uh, the so many folk hate their ex's sweetheart. 
That's what I'm looking for. Amen. So many folk hate their ex's sweetheart. Why? Because that's your replacement. And whether it was an upgrade or a downgrade, you still don't like them. She's not as pretty as I am. <laughs> she don't cook like this. You don't know that. <laughs> you ain't never ate at her house. <laughs> she don't know how to dress. She got the same outfit you had on. <laughs> they look better on me, though. <laughs> All right, well, you are the angels that fell. You are their replacement. They don't like you and they ain't never going to like you. Amen, somebody. All they want is to steal, to kill, and to destroy you and everything in your life because they're out of position and can't never get back and they jealous that you was messed up and got back. And since you got back, you mess up some more and you still get back. You are capable of repentance and they are not. They hate you. The devil is not your friend. And he never was. Amen, somebody. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Meaning, those who can testify of their salvation through Jesus Christ can also prophesy. Why? Because we've received the Holy Ghost. Not every spirit-filled Christian is a prophet but each one can prophesy. It's important to understand that. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Everyone with the Holy Spirit can prophesy. Prophesying doesn't make you a prophet. Amen, somebody. Amen. But we have the ability to prophesy simply means to speak or act out what has been revealed by God. All of us have the ability to do that. As a matter of fact, we are really called to do that. When we witness to somebody, we are intended to be led by the Spirit. And if we're led by the Spirit, the Spirit will give us the right words to say in the right order, with the right vocal inflection, with the right posture, to strike something in somebody else's mind. And whether they respond right now on the spot, or whether it just begins to burn to their psyche, so that later on the lights come on. Either way, if we follow the, the leading of the Spirit, he will do it perfectly. Don't be discouraged because you witness to somebody in Kroger and they don't give their life to Jesus right now. Amen? I mean, I'm a, we're always looking for that. We're always looking for, well, let me call my pastor. We can go over to the church. He'll meet us at the church. He'll baptize you right now. We're always looking for it, but it doesn't always happen that way. By a show of hands, how many of you got saved the very first time you heard the gospel? Not a single hand went up. So why do we expect other people to do it that way? You had to hear it and ignore it and hear it and ignore it and hear it and think about it and then hear it and hear it and hear it and hear it. And then eventually something clicked and you said, you know what, I'm tired. I'm going to try something else. They keep saying it's better with Jesus. It's got to be better than this. But you know, if somebody else was afraid of rejection so they never shared it with you, how would you ever gotten saved? Like folk get so sick and tired of life and they want something else and they don't know what something else is so they kill themselves. You didn't have to do that. You could have came to Jesus. So you witnessing to somebody may very well save their life, not just their soul. Because you're giving them the answer even if they don't want it right now, even if they're not going to use it right now. Keep sowing seed. There's going to be a harvest after a while. Amen, somebody. You don't plant and harvest in the same week. Anybody around here ever had a garden? A couple, couple of gardeners. All right, we, we got cucumbers or tomatoes or something. All right. How many of you have ever planted the seeds and, and got your ripe fruit or vegetables in the same week? Nobody? Oh, okay. Okay. Why pastor keep getting up there giving that same altar call every week? 
because pastor knows that somebody sitting there looking at me is just going to sit there and look at me. And they're going to sit there and look at me for weeks. They might sit there and look at me for months. But if I just keep on sewing, I've seen it. Eventually, they get up out of that seat and they come down to the altar. Sometimes with tears in their eyes. And they give their life to Jesus. Amen? You just keep sewing. All right. Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 16. This portion is Christ on a white horse. Verse 11. Now I saw heaven opened. And behold, a white horse. He who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. Amen. His eyes were like a flame of fire. Amen. Can you imagine you look at somebody and their eyes are like flickering flames of fire? On his head were many crowns. Why? Because he's the king of everything. He's the king of everywhere. He's the king of everyone. He's the king of Christians, and he's the king of atheists. He's the king of heaven, earth, and hell. Oh, wait, I thought the devil was the king of hell. The devil is the king of nothing. The devil made nothing. He's the owner of nothing. He's the king of nothing. Everything that is, Jesus is king. He's in charge of heaven, he's in charge of earth, and he's in charge of hell. Whatever he says is what's going to happen everywhere. There is nowhere where he's not king because there is nowhere that wasn't made by him. Amen, somebody. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. Interesting because I know also that I've got a new name over in glory. You've got a new name. God puts an extreme importance on names. With God, a name indicates character and destiny. There are certain key figures in the scripture who God changes their name. It's important. There was a man by the name of Yaakov, or we would say Jacob. Yaakov, Jacob, it means heel grasper, con artist, trickster, scammer. Can you imagine your mama named you that? Oh, look at my baby. She's so sweet. What's her name? Scam artist. Hmm. My sweet little scam artist. My, my little con artist here. <laughs> so when you look at his behavior, you see they named him what he turned out to be. He basically tricked his brother into selling the birthright can't really blame that on Jacob. You really got to blame that on Esau. But still, Jacob knew he was taking advantage of a hungry man. Then Jacob and his mother conspired together to trick his father into thinking that Jacob was Esau so that he could steal the blessing. He was a con artist. Amen, somebody. But Jacob was out in the wilderness and he encountered somebody, the angel of Yehovah, Yehovah in angel form. And he wrestled with the Lord. He wrestled with the Lord in angel form, the angel of the Lord. And he held on to him. And the angel said, now let me go. The day is breaking. I got to get on. I got stuff to do. I'm busy. Jacob was holding on. So the angel of the Lord put Jacob's hip out of joint. He injured him. Extreme pain. That, that'll make you let go. And Jacob, though his hip was exploding with pain, he held on even tighter. I will not let you go until you bless me. 
I need a blessing. I don't care how much it hurts. I'm going to stay here until I get blessed. So the angel of the Lord told him, no longer will your name be con artist, heel grasper, scammer. But instead, your name will be he who perseveres with God. He who endures with God. Your name will be Yisrael. So Jacob became Israel. He who perseveres with God. When God changes your name, it means something about you. He changed his trajectory. Okay, you've proven that even through pain, you will hold on to God. So that's going to be your new testimony. Well, guess what? Regardless of what our mothers named us, God has a new name for us. And we, when we get to the other side, we're going to find out who we really are. And he himself has a name that only he knows. So we're going to find out his highest name when we get there. Amen. But then we get one of his names. He was clothed with a white robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Amen. And so I'm going to ask you to go with me to John chapter 1. This should be a very familiar passage to all of you. Amen. We're going to read verses 1 through 14 in John chapter 1. And knowing how this goes, this might very well take us to the end of our hour. Amen. John chapter 1. But here we see that the rider on the white horse, Jesus, amen, his name is called the Word of God. We know he's also called Emmanuel. His name is also called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I love that one, by the way. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a what? A what? A what? How you spell that? S O N. Unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting What? The son is the everlasting father. Those of y'all that's watching, you knew why I just threw that at you. That's the book. When you get to heaven, you ain't never going to see three. It's only one. There's one throne and there's one who sits on it. The son is the father in the flesh. All right. And he also is the word of God. You know why? Because when God speaks, he speaks his mind. Let that one marinate for a second. When God speaks, he speaks his mind. Verse number one, John chapter one, verse number one. In the beginning was the word. Let me stop right there. That's why I said this will probably take us to the end of the chapter. All right. In the beginning was the word. The word is the Greek word supposed to be an O. Logos. Some people say logos, but logos either way. Amen. Now, logos means, my O's are not coming out here. Word, it means thought. It means idea. Logos means Plan, logos means mind. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. In the beginning was the word of God, and the word was with God, and the word was God. In the beginning was the thought of God. And God's thought was with God, and God's thought was God himself. You ever want to know what God was thinking of? God's plan was about himself. The Logos, the thought of God was with God, and the thought of God was God. In the beginning was the idea, 
And the idea was with God, and the idea was God. In the beginning was the plan, and the plan of God was with God, and the plan of God was God. What is God's plan from eternity to eternity? Jesus. He made an entire creation, an entire universe, so that he could be Jesus. God's plan was Jesus. Who is Jesus? Jesus is God. In the beginning was the plan. The plan was with God, and the plan was God, and the plan is Jesus. He was thinking of Jesus. The thought was, was Jesus. The idea was Jesus. Your life is about Jesus. And if you don't make it about Jesus, you become junk. Anything not focused on Jesus is non-functional. When something doesn't work for what it was made for, it's junk. You throw it away. In Israel, they throw it in the trash heap to be burned. Trash heap is called Gehenna. And from Gehenna, we get the word hell. Why do people go to hell? Well, they weren't functional for what they were created for. They weren't centered on the plan. And the plan is Jesus, who is God. In the beginning was the plan, and the plan was with God. The plan was God. You want to get with God? Get with the plan. Get with the program. This right here, this is what we're doing. Do this. Most of us saying, nah, I don't want to do that. I got my own plan. No. It might be mean to say so, but it's still true. Stupid. Stupid. All right. And, and, and that being said, we all at some point were stupid. Thank God for his grace, which allowed us to come out of stupidity. Amen. In the beginning was the mind. And the mind of God was with God. And the mind of God was, are you someone different than your mind? Who is that voice you hear in your head? Is that Robert from down the street or is that you? Who's thinking your thoughts? Whose thoughts are you hearing? That's you. Your mind is you. Just like your mind is you, God's mind is him. All of these things are wrapped up in the word, word. The logos. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So we know that the word is a he. It's not just a what. So in English, a word is a what. It's a thing. But this word is not just a thing. This word is a who. Because we just called the word he. All right? He, the word, was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Who? The word. And God said, let there be. And it was. He made everything by his word. Amen? All things were made through him, the word, and without him, the word, nothing was made that was made. He spoke everything into existence. Somebody said, oh, wait, 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 but, it, but it, says, it says that he formed man, so that would imply he used his hands, yeah? But before he formed man, he said, let us make man in our own image after our own likeness and let him have dominion. He spoke it first. Then he did it. Even you are the product of his word. I could stop here and go into outer space for the next four hours. <laughs> Amen. But I suppose I probably shouldn't do that. But, but let me just give you a telescope to see out the deep space real quick. Can I do that? All right. If everything in this world is formed by the word, then everything in this world is composed of the word. Everything is the word. When he called for trees, trees came into existence. From what? From the word. So wood, at its microscopic level, is the word. You're sitting on wooden pews. You're sitting on the word of God when he spoke trees, and trees kept reverberating throughout eternity. Trees are still coming forth because he said, tree be and tree started being and tree is still being that's why you can sit on it 
And if you ever said, tree, stop being, you'd fall to the floor right now. He didn't have to call every tree. He said, trees be, and every tree came out. Mm. You're breathing air. You know why you have air? Because he called for the air, and the air is. You're breathing the word of God in the form of air. Do you know that if you get a virus, that's the word of God reverberating at the frequency of virus? Even sickness and disease is composed of the word. So when he says that those who believe will cast out devils, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover, how do, how do we do that? By the authority of the one who spoke the word. He who made the virus has the authority to tell the virus to leave, and he tells the virus to leave through your mouth. When you follow the instructions, you lay hands with the oil, you do what he said, the virus that he made has to respond to its maker. Amen, somebody. You know what that means? It's not really any superstar healing evangelist. The superstar is God. There's people who just believe him enough to do what he said. But if anybody will just trust him enough to do what he said, he can use you just like he can use T.D. Jakes. Martha Munizzi, Juanita Bynum, Rod Parsley, whoever. I don't know who's popular now. Amen. But whoever the big people are, they're no different than you. Some of them just trust God more than you do and are bold enough to stand up and to do what he said. Do, do they have a different Holy Ghost? Did T.D. Did, did Jakes go and, and purchase the premium Holy Ghost Plus package? with live sports? No. He got the same Holy Ghost you got. It's funny because we call big name preachers in the town and when they do a healing line, everybody run and run down there. Amen. Now, I'm not, I'm not bitter. I don't care at all. <laughs> I want to clarify that. Amen. Because when you say stuff like this, people go, oh, you're jealous. I'm not jealous. I have an understanding. Okay. But see, when the local pastor called for folks to come get healed, everybody sit there and look. If Noel Jones say, if you need healing, run down here, the church be empty, everybody's at the altar. Same Holy Ghost. You know what made the difference why you got healed by this one and that one? Your faith. Did you believe God to do it or did you not? Okay, let me get back over here. Everything in the universe has to respond to the voice of the speaker. Not you. When you speak his word, the universe hears him speaking through you. Amen? All right. I didn't make it very far. Um, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything that was made. Verse 4, because it's getting good here. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. In him was life. The word life means connection. In him was connection. And what is the greatest connection? The connection of anyone to God Almighty. That's the only connection that matters. That's eternal life. That is everlasting life. It's being connected to the everlasting one. In him is our way to get connected. And the life, the connection, was the light the way, the truth, the knowledge, the wisdom, the path of men. So the only way to know truth is to get connected to God. In him was the connection, and that connection is the truth, the, the way, the path, the enlightenment of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. You have heard me talk about that. If you've been here long enough, you've heard Bishop talk about it. That word comprehend doesn't mean understand. It means capture. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can't capture it. The darkness can't stop the light. The lie cannot stop the truth. Amen. Amen somebody. Sometimes it looks like the darkness is winning, 
but just keep on shining your light. When you look up at the sky at night, you see a bunch of different lights, and the sky is mostly dark. But if you wait long enough, the whole sky is going to light up in the morning. The darkness cannot win. Amen, somebody. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He, John, was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That word witness is the Greek word martus. It means to be a martyr. He was sent to give his life for that light, and he certainly did that. He was beheaded. Verse 9, that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. What a tragedy this is. That Literally, everybody was born because he said so. You're breathing because he gave you air to breathe. You can see because he gave you light to see. You can think because he gave you a brain that can think. And the vast majority of the world refuses to acknowledge him or to know him. It's sad as what it is. We thank God for his grace towards us or we'd be in that sad group. Verse number 11. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Once again, that word believe is the Greek word pistuo, and it means trust. So those who trust in him receive the right or the power or the ability to become the children of God or the sons of God. These two phrases mean the same thing. Uh huh. Who were born not of blood, so it's not about your bloodline. It's not about being called a Jew or an Israelite. It has nothing to do with your blood. Nor of the will of the flesh, you couldn't make yourself his. Nor of the will of man, but of God. Only God can save you. Only God can declare who's his and who isn't. That's why we get filled with the Holy Ghost. We begin to speak in tongues, because... That doesn't come from the outside. He's the only one that can confirm you as his son or daughter. Verse 14. And the word became flesh. Uh-oh. The thought of God became flesh. The idea of God got wrapped in flesh. The plan of God became a flesh being. A whole plan became a person. The mind of God. He put his whole mind in the earth as a walking, talking, living human being. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word dwelt is the Greek word skinu. It means he tabernacled amongst us. Just as Old Testament Israel traveled with God in the wilderness and God had his house was a tabernacle, a tent, a temporary dwelling. That's what a tabernacle is. It can be put up, amen, and as long as the cloud was there, amen, they stayed there where the tent was. But when the cloud went up, they packed up all their tents and they packed up his tent, which was called the tabernacle, and they moved and followed the cloud. When the cloud stopped, they stopped. God said, when I move, you move, just like that. Amen? And that's how they were successful. They move when God moved. They stop when God stopped. I'm preaching real good right here. I just gave you the keys to success in every area of your life. When God goes, you go. When God stops, you stop. That's it. It's just that simple. And the word of God became flesh and tabernacled among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Mm. That phrase only begotten means one of a kind, species unique. Uh, 
we beheld the glory of the one-of-a-kind Son of a God, the species unique Son of God, the special, the miracle Son of God that was foreshadowed. It was for, he was foreshadowed by Isaac. You know, the Bible calls Isaac Abraham's only begotten son. But Isaac was not Abraham's only born son. He wasn't even the firstborn. Abraham had a son named Ishmael, 13 years older. So how does the angel of the Lord call Isaac Abraham's only begotten son? You did not withhold from me your son, your only son. What does he mean? Your one-of-a-kind son, your special son, your species unique son, your miracle son. Okay, that's the same position that is held by Jesus. He's God's one-of-a-kind special son. Why? Because this son of God is God in flesh. The word became flesh and tabernacled. He lived in a temporary house of flesh in our midst. He dwelt among us. All of us are living in a tent of flesh. How amazing is it that God came down in our midst and put a tent around himself and we called his name Jesus. Mm, how perfectly the picture is painted. When Israel set up their camp, all of their tents were set up around the tabernacle. The tabernacle was the center of their community, the center of their lives. Jesus. You're the center of my joy. That's what he wants. And he's still tabernacling with us. But now he's come to live with you in your tent. Which means your tent has become his tent. What? Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the almighty God? You've become his temple. You've become his tabernacle. And since he lives there, he's in charge. So he can tell you when to speak and when to shut up. When to go and when to stay. And if you follow his instructions, then he will truly be Lord of your life and others will see God in you. And somebody will get saved. Amen. All right. We made it. Uh, one and a half more slides. Pretty good. Pretty good. Amen. We're at the end of our hour. Do we have any comments, questions, thoughts? Nobody got up and said none today. Amen. But thank God for all of you being here. I can only assume I must have been fairly thorough. That's my goal. I want to make it so a five-year-old can understand it, if at all possible. I want you to be able to explain it to somebody else. All right. All right. Okay. Well, uh, if there's no comments, questions, or thoughts, amen, uh, let us remind you uh, that tomorrow and every Thursday at 6 o'clock p.m. is our virtual prayer meeting only on Facebook Live, uh, which is hosted by Suffragan Bishop E.C. and Prophet Brenda Haywood. Amen. Please join us online as we come together to call on the name of the Lord with people from all over the country, sometimes people from all over the world. Amen. There's power in prayer, and there's power when the saints come together in any form to call on the name of the Lord. Amen. Then we will be back at 9 a.m. on Sunday morning uh, for Sunday school and 1030 a.m. for worship. We hope to see you there and we hope you bring somebody with you. Amen. All right. All right. Uh, if you have enjoyed this Bible study, amen, if it's been a blessing to you, we encourage you to sow into the ministry of Greater Christ Temple. Uh, you can do that by way of Cash App. Our cash tag is dollar sign greater CTC. Or else you can go to our website, greaterctc.org. Click on the online giving tab, and there you can give by credit, by debit, by give a by PayPal, and even by Cash App right there on our website. Once again, that's greaterctc.org. Amen. All right, we're going to ask everyone to stand along with us for the benediction. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again 
for allowing us the opportunity to gather in your house. We ask you to continue, oh God, to let your hand rest upon us, lead us, guide us, and give us the strength and the faith to step out and do as you are saying, that truly you might be our Lord. Keep us, oh God, by your grace. We ask you to send salvation because of your great sacrifice to those who don't know you, God. Draw them into you. Use us that your name might be exalted and that their lives might be changed forever.